the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. The church had a choice. of how to commemorate the new year and of all the options that it could have chosen from the church chose to focus on the reign of the emperor Diocletian a hard-hearted man who sanctioned throughout all of the Roman Empire the slaughter of Christians one of the most hard-hit regions of this slaughter was our home country in Egypt and the surrounding areas. And so the church chose to focus on this time and this moment to bring in a new year. And so every new year, of the church, September 11th or the 1st of Tooth, we gather together and we all, as you saw, do a procession with all the martyrs and the icons of the church. And so it gives us a moment and a chance to think about the martyrs, our heroes, and their courage and their sacrifice. And uh, Taban, it's interesting to compare them to us now, sort of like a standard, like a basketball player that puts like a poster of Michael Jordan on his wall. Like we look up to them in the sense that we want to attain their blessedness, their courage, their self-sacrifice, their love, for Christ. And they become then an inspiration for us in how we are supposed to live. And we talk about every year how maybe we don't have the same opportunity to shed our blood for Christ. But more and more as time goes on, we realize that it d still takes great courage to stand up in the midst of all the evil and all the badness that's throughout all the world, to stand up and say, no, I'm not joining, I'm not part of that, that's not mine. I've been speaking about it for like the past two weeks. It reminds me of a passage from the epistle of St. Peter. He says, for we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. And then what he says is what I always think about, what I always remember. In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. So even before, like as years go by, we always say, it used to be not like this. America was so different before, or the world was so much better before. And then now we look at it and we say, oh, back then it was so much better. And then in 50 years, they'll look back on our time and say, wow, it was so much better before. Look at it now. This flood of dissipation, it's like overwhelming. And so even in St. Peter's time, in the very early church, there was the same things, the same traps, the same unbelief. We, thank God, have an opportunity in everything that's new, the new week, the new day, and especially something like today, the new year, to reassess how we deal with this flood of dissipation. Flood of dissipation means like an overwhelming amount of evil and bad. And what do we do in the face of it? And if you look to the example of the martyrs, the martyrs dealt with this flood of dissipation with kindness, 
with love, with courage, and following the rule of our Lord, allowing the Lord to speak through them the truth. Putting Christ as an example and leader and letting Him speak through them when given the opportunity. And the result of them speaking in the words of our Lord did not save them from the bloodshed that they received or the attacks that they endured or the tortures that they lived with. But rather, they were made witnesses to Christ in their suffering and were connected to our Lord because He first suffered for us. The Gospel that we read today is also a great reminder of this idea of like seeing what's good and following that. The Lord gives two examples in the beginning of this gospel. The first exa example is someone, he goes to a field, he's walking through the field, and finds a treasure that's hidden. He finds it in the ground. He digs it up and sees it. Now this treasure is not his. He can't have it. That's not his land. So he hides it. He puts it away again. And he spends however much time and effort to sell all of that he can, to raise up as much of the money as possible, to spend the rest of his life so that he can buy this land and take this treasure. Obviously, the example is weighing. This is how much I have now, and this is what I will have if I have this treasure. What can I do to make sure that I can give up what I have, which is meaningless, give it away, sell it, do whatever, so that I can get this other thing that's so much more valuable. And as you can see, it's done in secret. Because if he starts to tell people about this treasure and what he knows, then someone else might take it. So he spends all of this time and effort because he knows the value of the treasure in that ground, in that plot of land. And eventually he buys the land and owns the plot. Whatever is necessary. The second example, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. So imagine a merchant, all he does is buy and sell in pearls. And then finally he finds the one pearl. There is no top of this. There's nothing better. There won't be any better opportunity than the opportunity that he has in front of him now. And again, what he decides to do, as the Lord says, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Give up everything that he has. Take such a big financial risk because he sees the value of the pearl. And you can imagine in both of these examples, as they work hard, as they sell, as they're accumulating as much money as possible to buy this great, in the first example, treasure, and in the second example, this great pearl, the value of that thing starts getting even more and more and more. They can't wait. They can't wait to taste it. They can't wait to hold it in their hand. They can't wait to have it with them. They can't wait to put it in their home. So imagine, if we understand the parable correctly, and this great treasure... And of course we understand it correctly because the Lord says the kingdom of heaven is like this. So imagine if this treasure is the kingdom of heaven and we spend all of our time accumulating whatever we can to give it all away so that we can take this treasure. And what makes us know that this is the treasure that we should be like selling everything for? Like what makes it that this is the thing if you think about it, what greater love have you seen than the love of Christ dying on the cross for our sake, shedding His blood for you and I? Even He says it, what greater love than this, than one give up His life for His friends? What greater compassion have you seen than the compassion that our Lord had for all of the weak and sinful, like you and me, like me, 
forget about you. Like me. What greater compassion have you seen than this? What human have you seen have this same compassion? What anything? What greater sacrifice have you seen? The other day we were at someone's house and Abuna told someone there to read the whole Gospel of St. Mark in one sitting. And I remember thinking, and I said it actually at the time, that when we see the works of the Lord and we read it fast in one sitting, we see the sacrifice. The Lord himself said, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to rest his head. Didn't sleep. Didn't have a bed. He walked up and down the coast of what is now Israel and Palestine for our salvation. What greater love have you seen than this? What greater compassion have you seen than when he rose from the dead, the son of the widow of Nain, or when he went into that nobleman's house, Jairus, and raised up his daughter, or when he healed the servant of the centurion after the centurion showed his great faith. What greater compassion have you seen of anybody? So I think it's pretty sure and confirmed for us that there is no greater valuable gift than to follow him. We take then the example of the martyrs and follow him blindly, whatever it takes. The martyrs were willing to give up their own body and their blood and their families. There are terrible but inspiring stories of mothers giving up their children Husbands, their wives, friends, their best friends. Whatever it takes for the love of the Lord. So we have an opportunity at this new year to think about this very strongly. What am I doing? Am I actually following behind something that's like the flood of dissipation of this world? Am I just doing whatever it is that someone told me to do? Accumulating wealth or doing my favorite hobbies? or just doing whatever pleases me of my desires, we all fall into that trap sometimes. But how about we do a shift? And we literally give up everything for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, for the sake of our salvation, because there's nothing more beautiful. There's nothing that exemplifies love as much, and there's nothing that exemplifies courage and sacrifice and love of enemies. All of this, we should drop everything else and follow. So then when we start to live our lives in this way, we really take care to say, just like if you can imagine the person that was going to buy the field, if he went home and he was hungry, he might say, I can't eat tonight because <laughs> I have to save up to buy this field, to get this treasure. Or I'll sell this bed. It's too expensive. I'll buy something. I'll sell it and I'll sleep on the floor. I need to save up as much money as I can to buy this beautiful pearl. So we can also look at our own lives and see, are the things that I'm doing, are they leading me to my goal? Have I been convinced that this is my goal? Is this what I want in my life? If it is, and it should be, then we'll change some of the things and the way that we speak, the way that we talk, where we go, where we come from, our anger, our jealousy, all of those things will change because we have something that is valuable that we want now. So I ask you all to focus with me in these days before the Feast of the Cross. We have, what, 17, 16 days? 17. <laughs> to really give ourselves over to this idea that we want this valuable pearl that's reachable, that's been granted to us. We have access to it. We'll do whatever it takes to get it. And we'll stop whatever it is that's keeping us from getting it. And we'll make sacrifices. And we'll do whatever needs to be done to have it. This is the way that Christians live. They live outside of the flood of dissipation. They live with this idea in mind. One idea. Salvation. For me and my kids and my brothers and my fathers and my mothers and my family and my friends. And all my brothers and sisters in Christ. And glory be to God forever.